Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today we have part two with Kasim Hansen. We're digging into a lot more biomechanics, and we're also touching on things like different muscle lengths, training at different muscle lengths, uh, trying to match kind of strength curves with resistance profiles, and it's going to be a lot of biomechanics once again, so enjoy that. And as ever, please be reminded that we do have online coaching available at Revive Stronger. That is how we make our living. So if you're interested in some one-on-one, personalized, individualized online coaching, looking to lose some fat or gain some muscle, please do check out in the description and you can set up a consultation with one of our coaches. But without further ado, guys, let's dig into the show. That, I, I couldn't say it better. I, I know... Um, it hopefully doesn't sound like a contradiction, but I've heard people say like, oh, they use podcasts and that's their like formal education. And I'm like, please don't just use for podcast. Like podcasts are probably a step above like an Instagram, but we still can't, like we could talk for, we'd have to talk for days and hours and to really get into the depth of it. And I always think like courses, uh, member sites, if you've got your courses on there and um, your teachings and textbooks, like they are in a way that's to, deliver knowledge whereas this is like a it's just a discussion it's not like we're trying to give people uh, the way to go and like p- people aren't going to be able to leave this and like be able to apply everything to the t by no means it's just like skimming the surface slightly more than maybe the instagram <laughs> it's another step for people to decide whether or not they want to invest the time or money or whatever in, into that thing right i mean i love these discussions um you know um but i mean yeah it's like, look at all of these things as, as a way of filtering out what, what, what you're really going to invest in. Kasim, I'm, I'm interested. I know for like a powerlifter, often they're lagging, like you could, this is not always the case, but maybe they're lagging calves, side delts, because they're just muscle groups that for their specificity, they don't need. I don't know if you are into bodybuilding enough to like see enough physiques and know, um, maybe you are, but do you ever see, is there like common muscle groups that you see within physiques that you're like, this is very common that people lack this muscle group and it, maybe it's a hole within their exercise selection. Um, I mean, probably the most obvious one is usually the iliac lat, like I would say, right? Because the, the majority of what we would consider traditional back training um, tends not to be like very biased towards that, right? Like, so if people have been doing like overhead pull downs. They've been getting a lot of upper back. If they've been doing rows, you know, they've been, you know, getting some good lat stuff in there, you know, in conjunction with that and pull-ups or whatever. Um, but none of those like really target that tissue really well. Um, so if you don't happen to just be blessed in that area, I would say that was probably, that's probably the biggest one. And to be honest, that's why that solution, you know, came about. I don't, I don't, I don't think very many people know about my, you know, my career in the physique industry, because I prefer to be, you know, in the background. Um, and I was, you know, amongst coaching a bunch of people on the Olympia stage, I was also more of a fixer, meaning that people would come to me because they had a problem, whether it be a problem with their physique, a problem with their digestion, health, et cetera. Like, what, like, like I, I was that guy, not necessarily like, you know, the, we'll say you like the IFB approved coach or whatever that just chose the uh, drugs that they would use for the last couple of days before they got on stage. Um, which, I mean, it's funny. There were so quite a few people that I coached had a, we'll say a, they had a, they had a coach that was in the limelight that would essentially just maybe give the drug protocol, right. <laughs> in a sense. And then I would do everything else in the background, but I love that because it allowed me to just focus on what I, what I wanted to do. Um, but other than, other than lats, I would say it really, it really kind of depends. Um, you know, I would say you will have some people that have amazing delts and poor lats because they do all of their rows and stuff with their delts. Like everything is wide. And so they just have amazing rear delts. So it's, it's not that it's like everybody has this. It's just that you will see that because of the way somebody's technique has been is, is that they will just come in with this deficit. And then you might have another person that has no rear delts and they have great lats because they've been doing a lot of lat bias pulls and not having to do, uh, or and not doing much rear delts. And we've seen this happen as we've changed people's training too, where it's like, I've had an athlete come in and like the, maybe their, you know, their rear delts were one of their strong points. And then we actually teach them how to do their pulling with their lats. And then all of a sudden we had to add back in volume for rear delts because before it's like, lat day was 
just back day and now lat day is legit lat day so now it's like okay now we need to also make sure that we do things that are specifically for delts as well because you're not getting all that delt stimulus when you were just doing what you thought was lats uh before so i don't know that like outside of i would say that the another one that pe people probably don't care about that much i would say was probably obliques which really like you know, when you look at modern bodybuilding, like not only do the guys come in bigger or whatever, but like, it's pretty rare that you, you see somebody hit like that side pose and you have just that serratus and oblique, just look, there's those like lateral lines running all down the side. And it's not because they aren't lean, right? Cause I mean, you'll see, you'll, you'll see, you see veins in that tissue, but it looks like it's, I mean, it looks like it's a smooth muscle tissue on, on half of the competitors. Um, and so I think oblique training uh, is big. And I think part of that too is, is, you know, as you know, a lot of these bodybuilders have started using more machines and stuff like that, they're, you know, they're probably getting a little bit less of that trunk training, which means that like incorporating some direct work would be really good for bringing out, you know, the density, you know, in that tissue and just the ability to pose it. Right. I think that, that that's a big thing as well, because that, that's an un or I should say a hidden benefit of looking at all this stuff is, is that we can actually really help people with posing. Right. Because we can be like, OK, uh, now you know how to move a little bit better. Now you know how to correct, uh, um, contract this tissue. You have better mind muscle control over that actual tissue. So it makes posing more intuitive and better because now these motions that you're going through, you're posing, it's like, oh, I know how to move that because I've moved that in isolation and, you know, in training. So people tend to be able to rotate their trunk and position their shoulders and all of this stuff better. And it's like, okay, so literally we can add size on stage by just being able to improve somebody's range of motion and ability to pose. That's really cool. And actually it, it sounds like the best of all worlds having like a, so long as they were good with their drug protocols, but then having you in the background to do like the clever work, not clever work, mm -hmm. it's different work. Uh, so, because yeah, I just I recently interviewed Menno and he was saying basically, he thinks a lot of the top coaches, they're just the ones who know what they're doing with the drugs and can source good drugs. So it's kind of like, uh, it's good that they're you in the background to be kind of the fixer on that front. And uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all with, the iliac uh, lower lat just like that is a very novel yeah. exercise and nothing much really replicates that particularly well so that makes a lot of sense the obliques is interesting for sure um mm -hmm. absolutely i guess um yeah one other question i had for you uh i think will be really interesting for the listeners is i think it's become again it's one of those things where it's probably novel and so people are seeing it on social media and this is kind of banding exercises so it might be like reverse banding a hack squat that's become very popular um things like this and, and that may be a great example and place to start and at least from what i've seen from n1 again i have i haven't done uh, your course or um on your kind of member site or anything so I, I don't know this level of information but i don't see you guys banding a lot of movements in the same way uh to and, and i guess the thing they're trying to do is make it easier at the bottom. So then kind of where you're strongest potentially in the mid position. So they're trying to like match a strength curve to a, a muscle, uh, pro like a strength profile to the muscles profile. What are your thoughts behind that? Do you see that as something we should be aiming to do? Uh, do you see that as something practical value? Uh, is that something you guys do? Yeah, actually we do it a lot. And I mean, you know, um, I mean, you know that we're involved in the, you know, the design of machines with multiple companies. And yeah. like one of the things that we did with the, um, the new Atlantis equipment is actually put on better banding systems just, just for that. Right. Um, the, it's amazing if you ever make it, you know, I'll, I'll show it off to you or whatever. But so we use, we use a lot of reverse banding on pendulum on the hack squat, um, you know, and, but we, we don't use it like some people where it's, it's like they just start banding everything. Right. So I think there's a, there's a place of overboard where it's like, you know, any, you put bands and chains on things and it just like, it makes them more anabolic because of, you know, because there's bands and chains, but so it's like, there's places where that makes something better. And then there's other places where it might make it worse. Right. Like, so, you know, I've seen people do lateral races with chains and it's like that, that, that makes, that's the, that's the opposite goal of what you're usually trying to achieve you know, with those exercises, right. Or say, for instance, you know, doing a, you know, a rack pull or a deadlift where it's like, you're pulling up and the band is essentially just like pulling you down in the, in the standing position. Right. So it's just like, you're just adding compression to the body and you're not really getting more benefit, but exercises like the hack squat or the pendulum, where essentially 
your your internal levers are getting really long, which means that like the weight is is getting quote unquote heavier for you at the bottom, which means the amount of load that you can use and the amount of tension that you can create is limited by that bottom position. So let's just say that like, okay, the, what you can do is just 200 pounds of whatever we'll call it force or whatever at the bottom. That means that once you start coming up, you are now using less load than what you, you could use if you were to use a smaller range of motion. So the whole purpose of incorporating the band is so that like, okay, what we can do is we can still make it 200 pounds at the bottom. But now what it is, is like, I'm starting to get up to that middle. Now it's 250 pounds or 270 pounds or et cetera. Um, and I don't know if you saw it, but I did it. I did an actual, like I did a post on this, on the hack squat showing like using one big band versus two big bands of how it would uh, affect that profile. And so that's gonna, it's gonna increase basically the amount of tension required in that tissue throughout the entire rep, right? So basically it's like, all right, from a mechanical tension perspective, we would think like I'm getting higher quality, you know, stimulus per repetition in that way, right? So it's really, it's like from an efficiency standpoint, you know, I might be getting a little bit more, but that doesn't mean that's the only way that you should do it. Cause maybe, you know, with other exercises or whatnot, you might be like, I'm just focusing on the length and position, and then maybe we would take, you know, the band out or maybe just not use as much of a band. But if we're trying to say like, all right, how can I make the quality of every rep a little bit better? Then we want to try and make that resistance profile match what our muscles are capable of a little bit more. And there are some people that take this to an extreme level, which has a fault thinking that like you need to make it perfect and that you need to do that for every exercise. And what I would say is what you really need is you just need to make a profile that's good enough, right? So, I mean, if you've done hack squats to failure, right? Where you've, you've gotten pinned at the bottom, right? And so what happens is when you get to that last rep, you just basically, you move it a little bit and then you're just, you're just right back down, right? Same thing happens on say like a bench press, right? Like if you, if you fail, you couple, come a couple inches off your chest and then, and, then, and then you're just done. When you make that profile a little bit more balanced, what you're able to do is when you get to that, you know, when you would get to that relative state of fatigue is because it's not making that bottom position, this hard limiter for you is, is you're able to get maybe a couple more slow reps that you're actually able to push through with good technique because that profile is a little bit closer to what you can do. Right. So if I was to say like, okay, you know, having a profile that's a little bit better, gives you a little bit more potential for output and it changes what, what that failure point is going to be, right? So from a hypertrophy perspective, you go like, is this is an efficiency tool. And it's also a tool that allows me to maybe train, you know, with a little bit more intensity and have that be productive. Um, because one, I might get another rep or two and two, I'll be better off because I can, maybe it's like, all right, I can get a really slow rep to finish the set instead of being like, I thought I had it, but I didn't. And then I just got stuck. Right. So there's, there's some, you know, application benefit there as well. Cool. Yeah. No, I, I, I definitely know that experience of getting up and, or like it's either mm -hmm. getting pinned at the bottom or you like have to fight for your life to kind of get through that. Um, but towards the end, it obviously gets far, far easier. Um, as like you said, the loading isn't quite as much. Is there, is there a reason you might, um, choose to reverse band it versus putting a band kind of the opposite way. So like the band's kicking in as you come to the top versus kicking in as you come to the bottom. So like with bands, they're elastic, meaning that like when you pull it out like a couple inches, like say if you pull it out two inches and then you pull it out two more to four inches, there's a difference between the amount of tension that occurred during the first two versus the second two. Like it doesn't, it doesn't double. It, it, it increases more, the more you stretch the band unless you get to the point where you overstretch those bands, right? And if you've ever used them, people will know like that, like you overstretch them, they get thin, they fade in color, and then all of a sudden they become like snap weaker, <laughs> right? Yes, that's yeah, and close to the snap, right? So when you do the reverse band, what you're doing is you're making the band have the greatest impact at the bottom. If you do the band from the bottom to the top, you're having, you're making the band have the greatest impact at the top. And if you were, if you were trying to do this and you're trying to increase the amount of tension on the quads, 
you would want to use the reverse band because what you're trying to do is you're trying to just give yourself the help where you're the most disadvantaged, right? And then just have it kind of softly decrease the amount of help as you're going up, making the middle more challenging, right? And usually what we do is we try and have the band be doing almost nothing once you're basically halfway up, right? Because at that point in time, once you start stacking the joints, like... I don't care how much weight on there, right? Like if you're just the top half of a squat or a hack squat, that's not where the stimulus is coming from that exercise. So there's no reason to try and put a thousand pounds on the, you know, the top two inches of a hack squat. And that's what you're getting. If you do the other band this is like basically the hard, the place that band is having the most effect on you is, is when your knees are straight, right? Where you're like, you know, you could put 60 bands on there and it doesn't matter because you're not loading the quads there, right? That's what the leg extension is for, is to load that straight knee position. Don't try and make the hack squat something that loads there. You're just putting unnecessary uh, pressure for your tissue. So from a bodybuilding perspective, I don't really see any reason that you would ever band it from the top um, or from, from the bottom up, making it, you know, really hard at the top versus doing the reverse band, even though, you know, that comes with the stigma of like, well, if you reverse band it, you can put more plates on it. So people are like, oh, you're being a pansy because you're reverse banding it. And I'm like, but if I put more plates on it, I'm doing not, I'm not like, if I put enough plates on the reverse banded hack squat, I'm not only doing the same weight that I would have been doing at the bottom, but I'm doing more weight in the mid range than I would have without the band. Right. So done properly, you are actually doing more work than if you don't use the band. Right. Now, if you just throw 50 bands on there, you know, to put it and then use bumper plates or whatever, so you can just max out the machine for Instagram, that's different. But, but if you're doing it properly, you're doing actual more work uh, doing it that way. Now, for people that have a performance based goal, whether it be powerlifting or something where they're, they're trying to train dynamically for like, like, like speed right? So they're using a lighter weight and trying to use explosive. That's where banding from the bottom to the top really helps because the band like decelerates that load. So it allows you to like accelerate into that elastic resistance. Um, And that's where that application is really beneficial, but that doesn't have that much application directly towards hypertrophy training. Hey, Pascal here. I just wanted to take the moment to talk about our membership site. Inside, you'll find a thriving forum, an extensive exercise library, courses, presentations, and research reviews. All I need you to do is hit the link in the description below and sign up. I, I'm going to be really selfish with this question. I have a uh, Watson, ha- uh, sorry, Watson pendulum uh, at the gym mm-hmm. that I'm training at. I have been uh, not reverse banding it because I actually don't know how to apply it to it because it's against a wall and. Uh, maybe I can work it out, but I've been putting a, a band so um, the opposite. So when I'm coming up, the band kind of kicks mm-hmm. in towards the top. Um, but the reason was to decelerate it because I was finding that, as, and it's just a, a weak band, but as I came to the top, it was just kind of like the whole thing was like sh- shuddering around. So I was like, at least with this reverse band, it kind of decelerates me up to the top. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a, a good application in that scenario or if, I don't know if you know the Watson pendulum, but yeah, it's against a wall. So there's nothing this side. Maybe I can attach something to be able to kind of reverse band that. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it depends on how old it is. Um, so does it have a counterbalance on it at all? Because no, a lot of them, it so the oldest ones wall. had nothing, right? Yeah. yeah. So in that case, there's there's re- there's no good there's no way to really reverse band that. So I would say, you know, I wouldn't bother banding it if you're using a very small band just to keep that thing from wobbling around. You're getting a little compression out of that, you know, at the top, but probably not, you know, a detrimental, you know, amount. So, I mean, if that makes the exercises more comfortable for you, great. But is that going to do anything for the quad stimulus? Not, no, not, not really, not really in that scenario. And that's, that just goes to show, like, I mean, that's the reason that we do, you know, use accommodating resistance for that is in that exercise, you are so strong at the bottom, right? That probably once you get to about halfway up, you just can accelerate that load so fast that it just like, you know, it flies around. So from a technique perspective, one of the things that you could do is, you know, just apply the intent of your rep that's like, okay, I'm really going to drive out of the hole. But once I get to about like, you know, halfway up, instead of like continuing to try and push really hard, there's no longer enough resistance for you to really have to do that. So maybe you like, it's like you apply more intensity at the bottom and then you just, you let yourself back up to kind of like slow that rep down towards the top. And then what happens is, you know, maybe you actually get another rep or two by conserving that energy that you were expending where the exercise 
wasn't that beneficial by just not investing and moving the weights faster there. Right. Yeah. And you actually get to expose yourself to a little bit more volume where the exercise is, is more productive. So this is, this is something that we used to, you know, we used to put in programs. Um, you know, we used to have a column for like concentric intent. Right. And we'd be like, okay, so the intent could be, you know, it could be, we call it isotonic where you're trying to like move it, like, you know, a, you know, a, a strict, like smooth count. It could be like explosive where you're trying to invest all of that, or you could use an acceleration intent would actually be the opposite of what I just told you, which is where you would actually start slow and then squeeze a little bit, you know, like you would add intensity through the range, which is something that we do on like, like a lying leg curl, especially if it has a, you know, a profile that tends to lead to like flinging the weight up or whatever. Um, so you can, that's one of the best areas where intent can come in is, is like, if you know, what kind of that resistance profile is of the machine, you can choose to invest your energy where it's needed and not just, you know, create more momentum where it's really not going to provide anything from a stimulus perspective. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions I have, I guess, with the the reverse banding, you, is there an argument for how it seems to be that at that kind of lengthened position in the long muscle lengths um, where it is hardest by making that position a bit easier and maybe placing less tension in that range that you're kind of potentially reducing the hypertrophic stimulus from that movement? Or do you think it's made up by the fact that you're able to work harder through the other lengths? So it's important that when we're looking at that research that you don't, um, that you don't conflate the difference between the position of the, of the muscle or where in the range of motion versus where in the loading. So the evidence that we have now is showing that it is working in that position. Right. But we're not, comp it's not looking at looking at like doing the same motion, but with different resistance profiles, it's looking at working different portions of the range of the motion. So reverse banding doesn't decrease your ability to go to that muscle length. Right. So the correlation that we have in the research now is, is that it seems to be that the longer muscle lengths are good for, you know, or have a higher degree of magnitude in terms of stimulus for hypertrophy. Right. But we don't know if, adding the resistance profile on top of that, how much of a difference does that make, you know, or whatever. So I would say what you don't want to do is you don't want to, you know, reverse band it so much that like that now becomes like easy. Right. But like I said, if you're doing it right, you should be doing just as much work at the bottom or very close to it. Right. And as we get to fatigue, so here's, here's the funny thing about strength profiles, right? So if I were to just measure how much you could do, like if I put you in, you know, an isokinetic machine and I measured your elbow flexion on the first rep and we're like, okay, you know, where are you strongest? Where are you weakest throughout that whole range of motion? When you did the second rep, it would change. And it would be different in the third rep and the fourth rep or whatever. And it would be different if you'd done a different exercise first, you know, and, and so basically our strength, like our actual strength profile that we come and present fluctuates, right? And so one thing that always happens is we always weaken in the shorter position, right? Like we always, like we always start to fatigue there um, the most, like we lose the capacity to fully shorten the muscle before we lose the ability to come out of it. So it takes a really strong resistance profile to make us get pinned. And that's where like the hack squats, like it's so biased that it will literally get you pinned. Like you don't get three fourths the way up and then fall down. You get like, you know, maybe a quarter of the way up and then fall down. So using something like the bands or whatever, if, if you're pushing close enough to failure, you're still going to get to the point of fatigue where you are challenging those positions and like you would have to you would have to use an obnoxious amount of bands to we'll say make it to the point where if you're training even remotely close to failure that you wouldn't still be challenging that position if that makes sense so yeah yes it's possible that you could i mean you could do that right like so if it's if if you set up your reverse banded hack squat and it seems like you're firing out of a rocket at the bottom now <laughs> then that's, that's probably not good, right? But what, because what should actually happen, right? Is if you're doing this, is like in a regular hack squat, you're slow at the start, right? And then you can accelerate throughout the range of motion, right? Because, you know, it's getting lighter and you gain leverage. When you have that profile good, it, what it seems like is it seems like it smooths the tempo of that concentric because where you would be accelerating, you're now facing more resistance, right? And so that's kind of like, that's that sweet spot you should be looking for. It's just like, and, and if you've done this, you just know when that profile feels good. Like you get a good resistance profile and it's like that contraction just feels so good because it's very consistent. Um, 
that's what you should be looking for. It's just like, okay, I get this. And now it's like, there's enough of that accommodating resistance that it's challenging at the bottom. It's challenging its middle. That's decelerating. Cause the other thing is, is the only thing that is required for you to like really challenge the bottom, at least on the concentric is for you to just try and move the weight faster. Right. Like it, it like it wouldn't matter as long as it's like, cause basically you have inertia to, to work against. Right. That's why with a dumbbell lateral race, you can make it, you know, you can make a dumbbell lateral race hardest in the bottom by just simply trying to lift the weight up as hard as you can from the bottom position. Right. And so the hack squat is no different. So it's like, as long as you're actually applying intensity down there, you're not going to be void of, you know, resistance down there. And like I said, right now, I can't confidently say whether it's position or resistance profile or if you, compo- if, if you compounded those, if you would get a, a greater effect with the proxies that we have looked at, um, it seems that the range of motion seems to have the largest effect. Um, and this is especially true when it comes to DOMS as well, right? Which means the, the stretch mediated stuff on like the nervous system tissue and stuff like that. Um, so basically what we did is we looked at uh, doing, we did it with uh, elbow flexion and we did it with uh, knee extension, I believe. So, cause we have the prime equipment where you can basically just change the resistance profile in the exact same movement. And then we would do different movements that would take those to the like extreme short or extreme lengthened positions. So when we looked at just varying the resistance in the preacher curl, right. Or like the preacher curl machine, you know, lengthen versus using the short position or whatever, use the same protocol, same degrees of failure, whatever is, is that there wasn't a huge difference in soreness on the lengthened position versus the mid and, you know, short position. Okay. But when we compared that to actually training the biceps in its very lengthened position to the short position, even if in the lengthened position, we decrease the resistance profile, it still gave significantly more soreness than training in the short position with a length and biased resistance profile. Right. And so we saw that across the the quads as well. We did it with the leg extension. Um, and if anybody, like anybody out there that's ever done like a, like a, a Vince Geronda protocol or what we call an IRM, where it's like, you do like eight sets to eight with 30 seconds in between or whatever. Right. Which should be a fairly metabolic program. Um, if you do that on like a leg extension, it's like, it'll kill you on the day. Like your quads will be burned. They'll be pumped, you know, to, you know, to the nines, but like, you might feel like tomorrow or the next day that you're like, you're, you're good to go on quads again. Okay. If you do that with even a modest load on a hack squat or squat or something that like really, you know, takes you into that full knee flexion, just adding that few extra degrees, you you're wrecked, right? Like, like you're wrecked. Um, so it seems like, in terms of if, if we use that as a proxy and we also look at what we've kind of seen in terms of, you know, our moxie data or whatever, it seems that there's a slightly difference in the internal BFR that we get, like when a muscle is under more stretch, um, is, is that I think the position is going to be, we'll say in the hierarchy, the most important thing. And then I think it's like, as long as your resistance profile is good enough, it's, it's just not trash that you're really going to, you're really going to reap those benefits. Right. But I don't, but I think like if you skimped the range, but you had a really, so it's like, let's say if you did a regular hack squat, but you cut out the bottom quarter versus if you did a banded hack squat, but you did full range, I would say the, the full range banded hack squat would be better than the other hack squat, even though the, you know, the partial range would have had the more lengthened bias resistance profile. Hopefully I'm not confusing people too much by that, but you know, I think I was following it. It, it essentially, okay. you want to be training muscles at long muscle lengths where and the resistance profile wants to be decent enough to feel yes. good. You don't need to worry too much about where it's most challenging in that movement, apart from not making it a trash kind of resistance profile yeah. to your strength curve. Yeah, it should be relatively challenging in the majority of the motion. In the instance of the hack squat, it's never going to be challenging at the top, right? But it just shouldn't become easy at the bottom, if that makes yeah. sense. I guess that would mean, and uh, I think Mike's actually said this about like leg extensions. You'd have to do so many leg extensions to get the same like hypertrophic stimulus as you would to like a full depth, like hack squat, for example, because I guess that's the long muscle length. You're just not getting that on yeah. a leg extension. Yeah. If, if we go by, if we go by that, it has to be to the extreme 
then that, that logic carries over because you just can't get a full stretch and a leg extension. And honestly, I think, you know, whether, whether that is actually true or not, I would still do it that way. Cause in the leg extension, your foot is not supported or whatever. So it's just not the best place to train full, um, or a full, a fully lengthened knee flexion, but you know, like the, there was the post from Chris Beardsley and there's, there's been a couple posts now on leg extensions or whatever, showing that the bottom, like, but they're not like, they're doing the bottom of the knee flexion, um, is still superior. So the question still remains is how lengthened, right? It's like doing, cause maybe, maybe it's, maybe it's like the failure thing of like, all right, going to like complete utter failure, does that necessarily mean significantly more hypertrophy than stopping a rep or two shy, right? Going to the complete most deepest stretch, is that necessarily better than getting 90% to the stretch, right? Because like what we have now is that, hey, like close to lengthened seems to produce better hypertrophy than close to short, you know, with the same parameters. Right. But we don't like, cause, but we don't have a comparison of doing the bottom of a leg extension versus the bottom of a squat, you know, per per se. Like we don't have the data. So like I said, if, if, if you base your theory off of that, it has to be to the absolute extremes, then that, then that rings true. Right. But I would say like, I don't, and you know, this probably all exists on a continuum anyway. Right. Cause it might be like, look, if I choose the exercise that isn't the most lengthened thing or whatever, but maybe I do one more set, right. Yeah, or I work, you know, exactly. one, or I work one rep closer to failure or whatever, then maybe that then makes all of that, all of the, all of that mute. Right. And I think there's a lot of instances in that in training that people just, you know, don't account for. Like it's, it's fun to talk about these single variables, but it's like, Hey, you know, when it comes to this hypertrophy equation, you have all of these dials that you can turn right. To still get a benefit. Right. Cause I did, I've had this conversation of like, do you have to do the most perfect optimal best exercise? But like, no, you have to do an exercise that's good enough, hard enough, you know, consistent enough with enough volume and then, and then recover from that. Right. And if you do a better exercise, then that turns one dial. Right. You know, you know, but if you do a worse exercise, but you, maybe you turn up the volume thing a little bit, then maybe, maybe that, maybe that completely, you know, balances it out. Right. And so we teach this, um, we teach this thing in our seminar called the principle of thresholds, where it's like before you try and get so neurotic about any one variable in training, what you need to do is make sure every variable in training is brought up to a productive threshold, right? Because otherwise you get like what we call like, it's like a, it's like a, a zero multiplier, right? It's, it's like, okay, if any of, if any of the important variables is a goose egg, then it doesn't matter how good all of the other things are. Right. And you can take that to like the ridiculous, you know, proportions of like, well, look, if you don't eat, <laughs> you won't grow. Right. You know, or, you know, no amount of, you know, squats is going to improve your biceps or, or whatever it means. Like, so it's like, there are those is like, okay, if we, you know, if, if anything, you know, from, you know, exercise selection to technique to volume or whatever is not at least at the threshold where it's like, okay, cool. Now this is going to be productive then trying to be the best in the world, you know, at the lap pull down is going to be going to be pointless. Right. No, absolutely. I think it's yeah easy to miss the forest for the trees when you get too in depth with this sort of thing. Or I'm thinking like a, a football team might have an outstanding player, but if the rest of the team is just completely trash and they can't communicate, it's it's a terrible yeah. football team. You need a, a team that can actually play together. So I think it's brilliant that you you pulled back the lens to that level as well, uh, which is something I really appreciate from the work you're doing as well. And uh, because I think it would be easy to be like, oh yeah, you need to be doing these like sexy exercises, but you very often will pull it back and be like, this only matters in the context of everything else being in place, which I think is really cool. And actually a really interesting discussion on the kind of the degree of how lengthened, because like you said, that lengthened position creates the DOMS often the soreness and that's fatigue generating. It's like, well, if we did a bit less, could we do a bit more stimulus and less fatigue? Yep. And it's that trade-off again, like you said, with the failure and how does that uh, kind of go? I, I think Brad, um, I just interviewed him recently and he said, I think he's doing a study on kind of kind of trying to get complementary strength profiles to resistance profiles um, or curves. I always, I don't even know if there's like a right or wrong word with profiles and curves, I always interchange. Um, 
so yeah that that should be interesting you might be able to give us a bit more there and it's interesting you brought up the the prime kit i guess is the same as like the strive um they're two pieces that in my new gym they have some kit that allows me to manipulate that so i guess is that so i guess you can manipulate it for purposes like you're saying maybe you put it in the shortened position because you want to emphasize metabolite buildup or what have you um or you might choose somewhere else what's your like if you were to say someone who's got this kit available to them what sort of where would you get them placing their load on on the resistance profile you know from a hypertrophy perspective like so without having to do math without having to know anything about you know internal you know strength profiles etc the big thing that you want to do is you want to you want to put the plates on there so that for the technique that you're using that you basically have what we call a consistent challenge meaning that like that exercise is work like the the whole time if we're if we're if we're trying to pick like okay one one common guide right now from hypertrophy perspective there are, you know like if we say like okay maybe resistance profile trends in the same direction that the muscle length then maybe we tend to bias a little bit more towards the length in position right so it's just like okay so if we figure out all right what however i've arranged these plates or whatever setting you turn the cam on it's like all right this seems to be neutral this is this is hard the whole time like okay if i move in the direction to making it a little bit more challenge in the stretch position then maybe that's moving me a little bit more towards a more hypertrophy biased goal if i make it a little bit more balanced towards the short position then that maybe biases towards that and then there's all kinds of ways that you can utilize that and change that just like if you're like as you're progressing between sets and stuff like that so because we know we fatigue in the short position one of the things that i love to do with that kit is is like i will start my set my lighter weights is i will put them in the short position right and then i will do that like like that lighter you know let's say i'm going to do i'm going to let's say i'm going to do six sets and like we'll call like you know maybe four of them the working sets and two of them the feeder sets or whatever something like that is i might take those first two sets or whatever and like challenge more of the short position right just you know for the squeeze the pump you know just like priming the nervous system and everything for that tissue and then i start shifting as i'm adding load i add it to the other section right so i add it to the different pin or i as i add load i move the you know the cam thing or whatever so that now i'm you know as i'm getting to my later sets i'm biasing more the length and position because i'm focusing really on the mechanical tension stimulus in those sets and i also know that the place that i'm going to fatigue first would be that short position right so it's essentially it's what i'm doing is is i'm decreasing what would be causing me to fatigue the most in that exercise and potentially give me a little bit more output by shifting the exercise towards what's going to be more you know favorable as i as i start to fatigue right so there's like having having those kind of tools there's so many different things that that you can do with them um and i would say the first thing i would do is you know figure out what gives you a consistent challenge right and from a practical standpoint you know because people are going to be using free weights and they're going to be using cables in addition to these machines is know what you're getting out of your other exercises, right? So for example, you know, the best back machines tend to be the machines that make the, the length and position a challenge. And they're the most complimentary because if you're doing a dumbbell row or a cable row or pull down or any of those variations, the hard part is always, you know, the, the short position. So it's like, if you find a machine, like, don't just do the same thing that you did in the dumbbell. You want to be like, okay, what can I do that will give me the opposite, a complementary profile of what I was getting out of my free weights and stuff like that. Whereas it's like chest training, all of your chest stuff loads the, the bottom more, your dumbbell presses, your bar presses or whatever. So if you got a machine and you can find a way to either make that a little bit more, or even better, if it's got a converging pass, so it gives you a little bit more range of motion than you could get with a, you know, a barbell or dumbbells. It's like, that's the real benefit about these exercises is like, Hey, you know, don't just look at the exercise for what it provides itself. Look for how it will complement what you can do, because you may choose to, instead of using it, like how you would on its own, you might use it differently because you know, you're doing another exercise in your program that you don't have the ability to adjust that like does the, does the opposite thing. Right. Cause anytime you ever done an exercises, you probably should just look at the two and figure out what's best and then just use that one, right? Rather than two, rather than just do the same thing in two different spots, you just do more of the one that is better. <laughs> Hi guys, Steve here. Just wanted to take a moment of your time to remind you of our online coaching service. At Revive Stronger, we pride ourselves on providing personalized service that will take your physique and knowledge to the next level. If you're interested, check the description and sign up. No, absolutely. Um, I think that 
the way I think about that is we often, like for the hamstrings, you want to tr train them in hip extension and knee flexion. It's like, well, you can take that maybe a step further and change, train the hamstrings in like a more lengthened or a more shortened position. You're just trying to not just batter the same area within the muscle group or the same function over and over again. You kind of want to, like you said, make it synergistic and complementary in nature. Mm. Yeah. And so a really good application for that, that I like is, um, so if I have a, if I have a day, that's a little bit more lower body push dominant, right? So let's say, you know, I'm doing my hex squats or what, so basically it's like I'm doing hip extension and knee extension exercises simultaneously, whether that be leg press, pendulum, hex squat, squat, whatever, plus squat, right? And so then I'll be like, all right, so I'm going to throw in the seated leg curl in here and I'm going to do knee flexion from a lengthened hamstring. But then I'll have another day and it's maybe it's like now my hip extension work is going to come from a straight knee. So I'll be, I'll be doing hip extension with a lengthened hamstring now instead of hip extension with a relative, you know, shorter and less active hamstring. And so on that day, then I would do the lying leg curl as more, so I would, so I would space out. So it's like, okay, if I have, have option to those two, I will, I will put them accordingly to where they complement the other exercises that I'm doing the most. And I won't just be like, well, the research says seated leg curl is better than lying leg curl for hypertrophy. So just use seated leg curl, like, well, yes, you seated leg curl, but don't assume that you would get that, that that's still going to matter if you're also doing RDLs or 45s or something else that also lengthens. Don't assume that just adding more of that same thing is necessarily, um, you know, going to make, gonna, gonna, that the net would still be better in those conditions. I love that you said that because I think that brings the point that you made earlier in terms of the program as a whole, because that's like you said, the paper is looking at a very isolated like thing. It's not looking at your program where you're doing these hip hinge variants included, which could just make up for that fact. And you don't need to then worry about it so much because I have seen people off the back of that being like, oh no, I haven't got this like seated leg curl. I've only got lying or standing or what have you. And I'm like you said there, like if they've got that good hip extension in the program as well, probably works out if you're kind of auto-regulating things correctly or you're balancing things out correctly you're probably fine that you're okay and you'll you'll still get that good growth <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah i mean you're still training the muscle at its length you just happen to be doing it and you know and it's different function right so well we will we'll, i won't go to as far as saying that you know that it's necessarily equal conditions but it's i wouldn't right. say that you should feel lacking you know, training under the training under those conditions of doing a lengthened hip hinge and then a shortened, you know, knee, knee flexion. I don't think that you're going to be like, you know what, I could have been a pro, but I didn't ever see the leg curl. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think that's going to be the limiter. And actually, that's something uh, I, again, will compliment you on in terms of, I think sometimes people do, I don't know, they might see their influencers training at really cool gyms and they have this really fancy kit. And even me, like it, it's nice having this Strive and the Prime kit, like actually Prime kits made really, really well. So the Strive kits made really nicely as well, just as basic machines, let alone the kind of cam. It is, or... so Prime is new Strive. They're the... Just, yeah, just to yeah, be yeah. clear, right? Yep. Sorry, so, yeah. So, so if you I have was a strive on that, <laughs> yeah. If you have a strive piece, it's just like prime is oh. is, is new strive. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So the same. Uh, so, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, so people might see it and they're like, oh, I'm missing out big time. They might feel really demotivated because they've got, I don't know, hammer strength or here in the UK, Matrix is like the really common one in a lot of the commercial gyms. But I like with a lot of what you're doing and what you're kind of saying here is like optimal is pie in the sky thinking anyway, but you don't necessarily need access to these kind of pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. As long as you think about your program as a whole, you can get a lot out of kind of basic stuff. Have you ever seen one of those videos? Um, they use, I've seen a bunch of them where it's like two guys. They're like, they're out in the middle of a jungle or whatever. And they got like, you know, a rock and a, you know, big piece of wood or whatever. <laughs> and it'll be like a time lapse and they'll build like a whole hut with like, you know, with like a, you know, a fountain, like just like, they'll just do this amazing thing out of like almost nothing. Right. You know, just like, just grabbing, you know, the things that are around them and then they'll create something awesome. So when you're looking at, you know, these fancy machines, or whatever, these are, these are amazing tools and they make training easier but you basically it's like you have the ability to use your brain to find other solutions to do this it may not be as convenient you know sometimes you may have to use two exercises or you may have to do like you know some special type of set or something like that you know to to make up for the fact that you don't have this machine but 
the nice thing about learning the principles of, you know, anatomy, mechanics, and, you know, a little bit of physics of resistance is then it's like, okay, I know what I need to accomplish. And then I can just look at what I do have and figure out what is the best way to do that. And, you know, if that's not something that's, we'll say so ridiculous, you might be like, this is worth, this is worth the effort. Right. And nobody can tell you like, Oh, I couldn't set that up. And like, well, that doesn't matter. Like that's that person's choice of like, Hey, you know, I, you know, I didn't want to move the bench over there. You know, that's too, that's too much work. I'm like, well, that, that, that's a, that's a payoff for, you know, the individual person. So like a, a really good practical example, um, cause try and give a little bit more of those is if you don't have any back machines that load the lengthen positions, one of the things that I like uh, to do that I've been doing for, you know, a decade before I had access to any, you know, prime machines or whatever, um, was to do something like a reverse drop set. So let's say you're doing a dumbbell row with, you know, like a 60 pounder or something like that. And basically you get to the point where you can't get that 60 all the way to the top and you stop, you would still have a ton of repetitions if you would do partials or whatever. So rather than just do like, you know, 20 more reps that are small, grab the 80 or the 90 or something, and then just do like the bottom quarter or half rep. So it's like, all right, I took the muscle to where it was in the failure of the short position, but because the exercise was so much more challenging in that position than the other position, that failure point was really only failure in that one piece of the range of motion. But from a muscular failure standpoint, there's, it's still got a lot to do in it's more lengthened position. So then it's like, okay, man, grab a lengthened weight and then do some, you know, like finish that set with partials there. So it's like, I, you can't get the profile <clears throat> it, you know, in one shot, but if you just simply use two different loads and two different range of motions, you can still work the muscle in its short position and it's length and position, right? So there's, there's tons of ways that you can find like, well, you can use tempo, you can use range of motion, you can use manual resistance, you know, all sorts of these tools to accomplish things that maybe a machine does extremely easy, you know, but you can still do it, right? Like, and that's why learning the principles of this stuff is, is so important, right? Because it just, it empowers you so much more in what you can do, you know, with your training. Cool. Amazing, Kasim. I want to say a massive thank you for you giving me an hour and a half of your time. Um, I think people have probably really enjoyed this and probably got a lot of kind of uh, a lot of them interested in learning more. So I definitely want to make sure they know where to learn a little bit more over on Instagram, but then also where they can deep into kind of more nuance and in-depth stuff. Yeah, so we're N1 Education on all of the social platforms, YouTube, Instagram, uh, even TikTok, as you said. Uh, but if you if you want to see the exercise that we've done, like if, if you know, read some articles, videos, N1 training is our membership site, you know, and it just has a ton of information as the exercise library, you know, and we do long break like breakdowns of some of those exercises too, or like a 10 minute video on, you know, how to do some of these things and the considerations for reps and tempo stuff. But from a biomechanics perspective, if you really want to learn this stuff like in detail, that's where our courses are. Like, for example, you know. Oh, instead of a, you know, a one minute video on social media or a 10, you know, 15 minute video on the, uh, the training site, we're talking like 30 hours of talking about, you know, okay, what is going on with, you know, the mechanics at this joint and how we would load it and stuff like that. And that's where then you really get the ability to make these decisions on your own and to think through these problems, uh, on yourself, not for everybody, by all means, some people just, you know, they just want to go, but Man, if you if you enjoy this stuff like I do, like having that education just makes training so much more fun, so much more interesting. And, you know, and then maybe you can join me doing uh, ridiculous stuff, uh, ridiculous setups and just seeing how people respond. Right. Um, but just don't take it to, you know, I won't, I won't drop names, but there are other people that do crazy setups that are just crazy setups also that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Occasionally those tags get like thrown in like some like stream setups. It's like, oh, you're turning into XYZ influencer. And I'm like, okay, got to back oh, it up I know. a little bit. I know who. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Thank you so much, Kaz. And I'll make sure that's all linked below so you guys can check that out. And we'll talk to you soon. Take care. So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Floor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course.
The Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another, a really cool community for people within our little niche. It's gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. It's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.